ahead and get started now. Um, uh, uh, today we have Heather Redmond from uh, Flying Fish, and, and in many cases, uh, Heather doesn't quite really need a, uh, an introduction to this group, because as many of you may remember, uh, she uh, presented at last year's Triangle Venture Expo. So uh, we're delighted to have her back again and, and do a bit of a deeper dive into, uh, into her, uh, her fund and her firm and what they're looking for. Um, but in terms of a brief introduction, uh, you know, Heather has held uh, multiple uh, senior positions at a number of uh, tech companies. Um, she's on several boards of directors, including, as I mentioned previously, uh, the WSU Board of Regents. Uh, uh, from an academic standpoint, uh, she has a law degree from Stanford and uh, a BA from uh, Reed College. Um, so uh, clearly a, uh, a terrific background uh, for, for being a venture capitalist. I, uh, I, uh, I really value VCs who have a background in operations, that it's not just as a VC or just as a business analyst or just out of MBA school. Someone who's been on the other side, I've always found really has a better understanding what it means to be an entrepreneur, to be an operator, to have to make payroll, to have to come up with strategies. So really appreciate that about your background. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you to, for a brief overview. And then I've got a number of questions that, that I will pepper you with, but as always, hope other people will jump in and ask questions. And, and, and if you don't, I may just call on you. So you know, Dan and Kurt and others on the call here, beware if you don't come up with some of your, some of your own questions. So with that, thank you, Heather, and I'll just uh, turn it over to you. There's, there's one little dog, uh, a dog named Georgia, that's on the call. And so I'm, I'm particularly uh, looking for questions from Georgia. This will be interesting to see how, how Georgia manages to do that. Uh, well, th warned. <laughs> well, thanks, you guys, for, uh, Duffy for having Duffy speaks English. What? Duffy the dog can speak English. He's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, Thank you all for having me. Really appreciate having the time to connect with you all. And of course, I'm hoping that you will not only have some questions for me, but also some insights um, on your market and uh, ways that we can get more involved and, and uh, see more deal flow from your neck of the woods. Uh, but in sort of a nutshell, Flying Fish was um, created now really in 2017. It's sort of a, when you begin a fund, it's always a little bit of a um, rolling start because you're getting momentum and starting to make some investments as you're raising your first fund. Uh, and so we began in 2017 with a pretty operator focused team and we continued that team. My two uh, uh, co-founders and partners are both deeply technical and have shipped a ton of product, uh, some of it uh, really crappy and some of it really good. And so they've seen both sides of the coin as have I. Uh, but we formed it with the idea that there was a definite gap in the Pacific Northwest ecosystem and it was a growing gap. Uh, we've always not had our fair share of venture capital, but in particular, we were seeing a widening gap between the sort of friends and family angel rounds and the Series A. The Series A was just getting harder and harder harder to get to and harder and harder to um, to attain. And you really couldn't, in our view, in many cases, get to a Series A without raising some institutional money just because the dollars were too great. So we were seeing, uh, when we got going, we were seeing sort of two to two and a half million dollars seed rounds after maybe a million dollars raised at the angel stage. Um, and we just weren't seeing those get done easily. And then the metrics to get to a Series A were lofty enough that you might not only need that seed, you might need a seed two or a seed extension. Um, so we continue to see that dynamic playing out now. Uh, if you hit those metrics for A, there are a lot of people that wanna do your deal, but if you don't, um, you're kind of left wandering in the wilderness and we were really looking to fill that gap. That, that has proven out and in fact, it's gotten, I think, even more extreme as we've rolled out the fund um, and uh, as COVID has hit as well, you know, the, the metrics for Series A continue to be very challenging and the seed rounds and the seed extensions or the seed twos continue to be growing in size. So I think we're seeing mostly like $3 million seed rounds now, uh, again, after some substantial capital already having been raised in the, in the angel investment space. 
Um, the other thing when we first started, which you know we started doing the pre-planning for this probably in more like 2016, we were thinking, hey, we'll be software investors because we've all been deep in software businesses and we know software. And that's a very broad category, as you know. But as we started to poke at it and really look at um, what not only VCs were thinking about and product leaders were thinking about, but also what some of the big consulting firms were thinking about, we really started to see sort of AI as a um, sort of a successor to software in some ways in, in terms of being a, a major investment platform. Uh, you know, much we've seen cloud revolutionize software. Now we believe that we see AI almost replacing the paradigm of software. You will still build software, but it will always be on top of sort of an AI backbone uh, as we move forward. And AI will be incorporated in everything that you do to try to reduce the amount of human um, input that you need in any system. So as we thought about that and looked at the opportunities that were beginning to be explored by some other funds and other jurisdictions and what we were seeing happen at Microsoft and Amazon where you know Amazon was basically ripping out their entire customer success machinery that was all rules-based and replacing it with an AI first system, ditto with supply chain, um, Microsoft obviously pivoting the whole business first to cloud and then to AI. Uh, we could just really see that there was momentum behind this trend. And luckily for me, it just happened that while my two partners had worked in just about every area of technology that you could think of, including devices um, and consumer devices, they had spent the last part of their collective career at Microsoft before going their separate ways to do other things in the kind of heart of AI and ML at Microsoft. And as you may know, Microsoft was very early to AI. They have a history of maybe being too early or sometimes too late, like in the case of the phone. Um, but they were very early into AI. And so Microsoft research has been one of the places that a lot of the great AI minds across the industry, whether that's Baidu or Google or Apple or whatever, kind of grew up. And, um, and so Jeff and Frank were lucky enough to kind of have a front row seat for that in the relatively early days when they were working on natural language processing systems for Microsoft. Um, so we realized, hey, you know, there's this seed gap um, there is uh, a burgeoning interest in AI and ML as sort of the next great technology platform, um, you know, forecasted by McKinsey and others to dwarf the industrial revolution and the software revolution. Um, and guess what? We happen to have two people out of our three person team who actually really know this stuff cold. And it's very different than going from sort of uh, you know, mobile apps to database to, um, you know, productivity software, the leap from software to AI is really pretty significant because it's not engineering, it's statistics. And so really knowing that field well is vitally important and, and Jeff and Frank know it. So we sort of decided on this, you know, kind of like, hey, let's not be software generalists, let's really double down on the AI and ML. Um, and, you know, fund one is mostly deployed at this point, uh, and the thesis seems to be proving out well. We've got a lot of companies that are raising follow-on rounds. We've had one great early exit, um, and uh, we think the AI trend is just, you know, continuing and probably even further accelerated by what we're seeing with COVID, where we see a lot of need for automation, a lot of need for um, automation for human safety, but also automation to drive margin as um, the opportunities for growth shrink, uh, and a lot of desire to make things more efficient um, for lots of different reasons, and uh, and to fuel things like you know cybersecurity when you've got everybody working remotely and and can't really manage it with some sort of centralized staff anymore. Um, trying to think of other things that I think are interesting. I think that you know our region uh, is still positioned very, very well post COVID um, and, um, and that we're going to see more venture here, homegrown as well as imported. Uh, I also think that we're gonna see a phenomenal number of um, companies kind of come out of this work from home moment in time. Uh, a lot of engineers that we know and pal around with are doing their day job in sort of 60 to 70 percent of the time that they normally allotted for their day job just because no commute, fewer meetings, um, less creativity in some senses in the day job just because you can't get people together in person to brainstorm. But they are doing a lot of side projects. Um, so, you know, patent filings are way up. 
Uh, we think, you know, little side garage projects are way up. And of course, you know, we have a, a triple disruption of, of COVID, which is disrupting the economy, but is also disrupting how people live. And then Black Lives Matter and all the other social movements around it that are really driving a lot of disruption that then causes opportunities to be sort of opened up in the cracks that you have in, in society. Um, so we're super bullish on the region, super bullish on early stage tech. Um, and uh, are, of course, you know, I, I hope it goes without saying, very interested in what's happening on the eastern side of the state. Um, so, you know, very happy always to be invited to come talk to you guys. I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Excellent. Um, you know, what you, one thing you mentioned when you formed your, your firm, you said that uh, the Northwest or Seattle has never really received its fair share of venture capital. I also have always observed that. But I've never really known why is that the case? I mean, with all the leading companies we have in, in the Seattle area, why haven't there been more VC firms in, 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 our, in, our, in, in the area? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with um, the DNA of the region. I mean, if you think about it, the way most VC firms are formed are spin outs out of existing firms. So if you start with only a few, that's, you know, it's hard for that population to multiply fast. And I think it's also been a feature of our region that it's hard to, to like break up with your partners and go start a new firm. That's not really culturally what we do. We're starting to see a little bit of that, but it's still very rare for somebody to say, hey, screw you guys, you're not giving me enough of the upside here, I'm out of here, I'm gonna go start my own thing. Um, that sounds you know, like, oh, I'm glad we don't have that here, but that's really how venture firms <laughs> multiply. Um, so it's in some ways, it's a necessary part of the, the, the ecosystem is to have that happening. Um, the other thing I will say, starting a firm is really hard. And we, as an investor block, you know, if you think about all the money in our region, it, it's a little um, old fashioned. Uh, it, a lot of it is, is, you know, you'll talk to people and they'll be like, I don't understand tech, so I'm just gonna invest in real estate and my old industrial whatevers. Um, or people will think um, because they lost some money in angel investing that they don't wanna be in a venture fund, not recognizing that those two things are like almost completely different asset classes. Yep. Um, and, and so, you know, partly I think we have ourselves to look at. It's kind of like, you know, if you're frustrated about how much venture there is here, which I think we all should be, you gotta look at yourself and you say, well, how many venture funds am I invested in? And if the answer is not enough, then then you have work to do, um, you know, because obviously we think we think the companies are going to make money. So we ought to think that the venture capitalists are going to make money and those two things should coincide. Um, we also as a state have not done a good job of providing incentives yeah. to, to venture. Um, Oregon, you know, has a lot of money that floats around to try to get venture to get started and, and, um, and to participate in venture funds. Canada does the same thing. Uh, Washington State has not done a good job of that. Uh, and you think about all the pension funds that exist and all the banks that exist in our region, it would be pretty easy for them to funnel some money into venture and, and do well, but also create more customers by creating the ecosystem that leads to growth. Very true, very true. I, I also agree with you about the gap between um, kind of friends and family and Series A. Um, in that gap, First of all, do you, is there a name for that gap? And then number two, because I hear you talk about seed, uh, you know, series seed two, seed extension. There's all sorts of names, but I haven't really um, found one that really succinctly describes that gap. And then um, when you invest in that gap, are you typically the first institutional money in that gap? Or, or will you do a, a seed extension that maybe another, uh, venture firm or professional investor has already participated in? Yeah, um, we will do both. I would say it's more typical for us to be the first institutional money in, and we'll even be in before really any angels are in too, if, if you know, the deal really makes sense. Um, I, you know, I think it's still the seed stage. It's just that people used to be able to go from angel to A, and that's okay. just not possible anymore. Um, the A metrics have just gotten too lofty. Uh, and, and you'll still find people who are, you know, calling something a series A, but raising $4 million. And we're like, that's not really an A, you know. 
um, or $3 million or something like that, just because they've already raised money. Um, the seed extension, you know, sort of seed two space is really interesting because you sometimes have the opportunity to pick up really good deals as somebody who's who's coming on in after they've already received, you know, some money from a professional investor or an angel group or something like that. Um, and that, you know, but, but substantial money. Uh, and that can be a really great space to play in. We haven't done that much of that, but it's always something that we look for because you can get a really attractive deal and get a company, you know, through that sort of additional work they need to do to get to the A, um, and that's super gratifying for everybody. And when you're when you're when you're investing in in that gap, do you have a preference or a bias for priced rounds versus convertible notes? Yeah, I mean, we always have a bias toward priced rounds. We just think that kicking the can down the road <laughs> does not make sense. And, you know, both investors as well as, as founders get surprised when they have all these notes yep. layered on top of one another. And yeah, it's, it's messy. Uh, I, I have a strong bias the same way. And frankly, I, but I'm really shocked by how many what I would call otherwise professional investors or, for, or very active angels still nonetheless will uh, participate in these convertible notes. I, uh, I probably shouldn't broadcast this, but I typically will only do it if it's the only way to get into a deal I really want to. Right. Um, but um, to me, they just, from an investor standpoint, just don't make a lot of sense. And as you've mentioned, not really in the best interest of the issuer either, if right. for some reason they don't hit their metrics and the maturity date comes up and you know you add options or warrants on top of conversion discounts and- Yeah, yeah, it can get very, very messy. Um, yeah, we have a similar policy to yours. You know, We really prefer not to do them. Uh, I can't say that we don't because uh, sometimes it's just so early and the team is so good yeah, uh, that they're just like, hey, we just got to do a safe here, and we're like, okay, yeah. we'll do it. But it's, it. I don't take it as you know. They shouldn't think of that as a badge of honor. I still think that it, it would be in their best interest to go ahead and, and just do a price round. Yep, agreed. So, um, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Can you? Um, um, you know, people have a lot of different um, um, ways they might describe the both of them, and particularly yeah. how machine learning is different from artificial intelligence. Could you kind of give your perspective on that? Sure, sure. Yeah, the sort of the textbook answer is that artificial intelligence is sort of the broader category, and and people talk about um, general artificial intelligence being sort of when you're as intelligent as a human, but you're a machine. Um, so the artificial intelligence really encompasses anything that, that could that could fall under any, anything from that scary you know thing that Elon Musk is worried about to a, a very simple machine learning um, application, and then machine learning really would be the ability of a computer, a software program, to get out external input based on what it's trying to do, and then continue to improve based on that external input. So the, the big magic here always for machine learning is that there's some sort of a loop. So I'll give you one good example, which is a pretty broad company that we're invested in called Symbol.ai. And Symbol would be um, sitting in the background of a meeting such as this or a sales call or you know any number of different um, applications, but someplace where humans are interacting and trying to get things done. And it would um, transcribe that meeting, but more importantly, it would pull out the action items and main points from that meeting. And, um, and then it, because it won't do that perfectly, obviously, because the, the technology is still being developed and, and, and also humans are weird and we all talk about things differently. It will produce into your chosen workflow a transcript, but it will also produce those action items and insights attached to specific parts of that transcript. So you can very quickly correct what the machine got wrong and of course, that's the magic part for us, which is that then goes back in and gets the NLP, the natural language processing engine that's running this to understand the next conversation better. Okay. 
And when you when you're looking at uh, investments in uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, are you focused on any particular industries? Um, you know, consumer, cloud. Um, and the reason I ask is, as you as you may know, you know, Spokane really has a number of you know, healthcare related companies, mm -hmm. some of which are incorporating artificial intelligence into their product or service offering. So um, I guess my specific question is if there was a, a company that had artificial intelligence or machine learning in life sciences or healthcare, would, would that be in or uh, outside of your investment focus? Yeah, you, you picked an area that's, that's super interesting. Uh, and it's one of those areas where barriers have really come down uh, recently as a result of COVID. You know, we, we all thought telemedicine should have been a thing a long time ago, and now it is a thing. Um, and I think uh, AI will similarly uh, be pulled into medicine more as a result of COVID. Um, we are definitely interested in smart medical um, and health related uses of AI and ML. We haven't done an investment there yet, partly because we know that that space requires a lot of specialty knowledge. However, we are very interested in it and we are busily building um, the muscle and the team to be able to evaluate those deals. So yes, I think those deals are interesting. To the extent that it's something that requires FDA approval, probably not as interesting as something that doesn't. And to the extent that it is a medical device as opposed to a um, software technology, probably not as interesting as, as ones that are, you know, that are more detached from the hardware aspect. Not that we're afraid of hardware. We have several great hardware deals, but uh, I think layering that on top of um, the already difficult landscape of, of medicine would be, you know, would be two hills to climb instead of one. Okay. Now you mentioned you already had an exit in your portfolio. Yeah. Yeah, we had a great exit in Fund One, um, gosh, about nine months ago now, a company called Stream with two E's out of Portland. Uh, and, um, and stream combined AI and augmented reality. Uh, so it was uh, a place where you could use your phone to basically get an expert to parachute in to help you accomplish whatever task you were trying to accomplish. It was mostly interesting for home repair as an initial go-to-market strategy. And they were bought by a big home repair company actually run by a friend of mine that uh, was sort of trying to go from being a non-digital company to a digital company. And he's the ex-COO of Lyft. And so they hired him as the CEO, a company called Front Door, and okay. uh, went, went off to the races. And one of his first uh, one of his first moves was to acquire Stream, which was brilliant. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, it's nice to get an early win first one. Richard, Richard, do you have a question? Sure. Thanks, Tom. And Heather, thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, it's fantastic to, to hear from you. Uh, it looks like you're a, uh, an attorney who's done well and sort of living the, the dream that all of us attorneys have had, which is uh, getting into an operating role uh, and then also then get on the investor side. Can you explain a little bit about that transition and how, if at all, being an attorney has helped or hurt you uh, at Flying Fish? And, and yeah. fair yeah. warning, Heather, yeah. Richard, Richard runs, runs Lee and Hayes in Spokane. Spokane. He's a lawyer. And, uh, lawyer. and uh, Lee and Hayes uh, uh, is one of, uh, out of Spokane, one of the nation's uh, most active and prominent uh, IP law firms. So I just wanted to give you that. Yeah, fair no, I've, before I, before I've you heard the name. I've heard the name. Uh, yeah, so definitely interested in, in what you guys, uh, you should be sending me deals for sure, Richard. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's an interesting question. Um, I probably went to law school a little bit by accident. Uh, I, uh, when I think a lot of lawyers do that, um, wasn't really, I didn't know what business was. Um, my parents were hippies and I was raised in a very unorthodox way and didn't have a lot of exposure to the real world. And so um, I think when I uh, was trying to figure out what to do for professionally, sort of I knew what a lawyer was and I'd watched, you know, some TV shows about lawyers, but it's very, it, Back then we didn't have Silicon Valley, so we didn't know what VCs did. Uh, but um, uh, I would say overall, the 
climbing out of the lawyer box into the business box is a very challenging thing to do. Uh, and um, I had to fight hard to do it. Um, and then making the further transition to be a venture capitalist is also a very hard thing to do. It's, it's super entrepreneurial, obviously. You have to kind of start your own thing um, and, and uh, put a lot of your own money to work, which is something that I find lawyers are often reluctant to do. Uh, they're not uh, big risk takers often. Um, and so I think for those of us who are, uh, it's, it's a great fit because your skill set uh, in being a lawyer is very useful in investing. I actually don't do any of the kind of legal work at our firm. Uh, one of my partners who's an engineer does, um, partly because uh, I find it annoying to, you know, to go through legal documents in great detail. I'll, I'll answer a hard question, but I don't want to do the grind. And, um, and also, I'm such a risk taker that I'm not the best pairing with our outside counsel, uh, because I'll always be fighting with them about taking more risk. Thank you. Sure. So you know, one, one question I always like to ask is, you know, um, based on you know, your history as both an operator and now as a VC, you know, what, 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 what are the three predictors of success of an early stage company and particularly one that might be VC backed? Yeah, I mean, I think it, the stage that we invest is probably similar to what you would say, Tom. We, we, uh, it's, it's so much about the team, uh, right? Um, so much about the team. It's probably team, team, and team. Um, that said, there is a tendency also in the Pacific Northwest to think too small. So sometimes we'll see a great team, but they really just aren't attacking a market or have a vision for a product or product roadmap that's big enough. And, and so, you know, we're really looking for um, that sort of team um, market fit, you know, sort of, do they have the domain expertise? Do they have the grit? Do they have a cohesive working relationship? Um, do they, you know, are they coachable? Um, some of the things that you would look in like a great hire, right? You know, somebody that can scale, but, but is also coachable and, and who has fire in the belly. Um, we're not, you know, super psychological or anything. We're not trying to run people through, you know, a bunch of psychological tests, but we are really trying to understand them, which is why, you know, sort of being a local investor helps because we can get a real bead on people pretty easily. Uh, you know, we're, um, we're able to, you know, really reference people quite, diff quite deeply. We don't typically look at um, the references people supply. We look at the references that we can get to that we think make sense for us. Uh, the, um, the other thing that I would say is, you know, we're obviously looking for some application of AI or ML, which can be very simple. I mean, we've got pizza making robots and they're using computer vision in a pretty pedestrian way. They're making sure the pepperoni's in the right place, right? And they're detecting other, other malfunctions of the system that go up into the cloud and notify you know, somebody that can roll a truck to go out there and, and swap out that, that particular part of the, the robotic module. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, not, um, it's not reinventing you know, the human brain. It's taking something that the big companies have developed in a pretty robust way and then deploying it in a way that really drives a business model. You know, that team, when, when, I, when, I, when I first started investing in um, emerging companies, I found that if an entrepreneur was a little too edgy, maybe a little cocky, a little over the top, I, I found myself to be turned off and I shied away from, from those characters and uh, gravitated more toward the boy next door or the, the nice individual. But I quickly learned that was kind of the wrong bet. You really wanted someone that was a little flippant, maybe a little cocky, a little over the skis. Um, do you observe that? And did you put, kind of have to check yourself and say, yeah, this guy's, you know, he's, he's kind of, you know, he's, he's spewing off a little bit, but you know what? That's the it factor that we need to have to succeed. Yeah, it's delicate balance. I mean, uh, I would say I don't look so much for cocky. I look for a little bit crazy, um, you know, because you you really have to be a little bit crazy to 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 undertake this this job, and you have to have 
some really big ideas that are driving you. Sometimes the cocky thing can be related to, you know, I just want to prove myself or I want to make a lot of money or something like that. And that sometimes doesn't sustain someone through all the hard times. So it's, it's more about finding someone who's got just deep conviction and, and also the grit um, to go through those tough times. Uh, but coachability is important too. Uh, you know, there is, and it doesn't have to be coachable by me or one of my partners. It's just that you listen to somebody, right? You know, and that somebody can be somebody that's a lot more qualified than me. But as, as long as you are willing to have somebody be your sounding board, um, because that's, you know, I think that's really crucial. It's a hard business to go it alone in. Yep. And, um, you know, even people that we think of as legendarily pigheaded, um, you know, like, like uh, if you think about, you know, some of the stories coming out of Facebook with Zuckerberg, you know, I, I know people personally who were able to convince him, no, yeah, you do need a CFO. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which apparently was a hard a hard argument to win, but you know somebody won it. And thank God, because he wouldn't be where he is. But um, the certainly quirky, um, you know, strange, eccentric, um, passionate people people that don't quite fit in. I mean, when people ask me sort of like, what's the number one characteristic in a person that you're looking for in an entrepreneur? I say it's an immigrant. And I broaden that because I'm not looking just for an immigrant. I'm looking for somebody with that attitude. And often that is like, I see things a little differently because I came from someplace else, whether that's metaphorically or physically. And, um, and I also, uh, maybe I see things somewhat differently because I was, you know, somewhere on the spectrum in high school and nobody liked me. You know, that's, that's great too. It's sort of an outsider in some way um, who can see things more clearly can see opportunities other people don't see and also has that drive um, yep. to make themselves work in the environment that they find themselves in. Yep. Uh, you, you described it uh, uh, um, better than I did, the, the traits for, for those sort of individuals. I've often was struck by, you know, both or Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison all have one common trait. They're all adopted. And I think there, there's, there's something interesting about that. And if you read the books by each of those individuals or books written about them, they all talk, that was really kind of uh, something that uh, was always in the back of their head and, and led them to, um, to, to see fewer boundaries and to live differently. Um, so. That's interesting. Well, all, all three of my kids are adopted. So you've given me new hope. There you go, there you go. Um, and then another thing, um, you, you talked about, uh, you know, being an entrepreneur, it's not easy and it's difficult to do uh, alone. Do you, will you invest in a company that only has one co-founder or do you have any hard and fast rules that you really want to see to, two co-founders? Uh, we do not have a hard and fast rule. We do think that a solo founder is a tougher road and we don't recommend it. I, similarly with venture capital, you know, I couldn't do what I do without my partners. Yep. Uh, and uh, so I, you know, I don't recommend being a solo venture capitalist either, although that is a new trend that we're seeing, particularly coming out of the Valley. Uh, but I, it's going to be a stronger team with more than one person. That said, if it's the right person and the, the right idea and they can attract a lot of talent, uh, then, you know, more power to them. Yep. We've got a question from Nick McLean and uh, Nick is a Spokane entrepreneur. Uh, he's actually a student in one of my classes at Gonzaga and uh, has started a company called Odd Jobbers that uh, uh, through my angel funds, I'm an investor in. Nick, fire away. Well, Tom, I'm kind of questioning what you think of me now after learning uh, you like to invest in kind of assholes, but... Uh, no, you know, I didn't use didn't that know. word, Nick. But <laughs> I think most people would... Uh, um, uh, would you, the terms that I used, or maybe the better ones that Heather used, they clearly describe you. Well, I'll take your word for it. Um, you're a nice guy. You're not, you're not <laughs> the other word that you said. Um, well, thanks so much for being here, Heather. Um, so I'm kind of curious what kind of role you take in companies you invest in. So, um, and I'm kind of interested because you mentioned that you kind of serve the gap between, uh, you know, seed and then series A, um, and you're usually the first institu institutional investor and you're an operator. So, um, you know, what kind of value do you 
like bring to the table as far as you know being an investor yeah i mean we are uh, we do seek to lead rounds and we do t seek to take board seats so you know in i would say 70 percent of the time that is the case we will be forming a board with the entrepreneur. Um, and so we're having an institutional active role through that. But regardless, um, we all talk to our companies at least uh, every other week. And we sort of view ourselves as being kind of on tap for anything and everything. Um, so, you know, that often shows up in hiring, in customers and in um, introductions to follow on around potential investors. Uh, and those are probably the three most common buckets, but there's other crazy stuff that comes up all the time. But we, we you know, this is a cliche, but we want to be the first call. We want to be the call that when something's going well or poorly um, and they're looking for some assistance that they come to us. Um, and that seems to be happening with all of our existing portfolio companies. Um, there's, you know, there's one philosophy of VC that just get in the best deals and even there's a further philosophy of just get in all the deals and then, you know, you'll make it up on volume, which I don't, I don't uh, subscribe to that, but um, there's the get into the best deals and then all you, you don't even have to worry about them. They'll take care of it and you go off and look for more deals. Um, we're more of the school of there are things we can do to help. And some of that help, particularly at that seed stage can be really, really important. Like customer introductions. Um, so we work really hard on having a super broad network of potential customers, um, you know, hopefully mostly semi-local so that people can have that touch with a customer in the early days of developing their product where they get a lot of feedback. Um, and then we're also very intent on being sure that we can get people to the next round of financing because that's crucial for our success as well as yours. Um, so yeah, I'd say on the spectrum of involvement, we are pretty darn high. That said, if it's somebody who's a super experienced entrepreneur and they just tell us, you know what, we got this, then we don't want to be in somebody's face wasting their time. Um, so we're happy to stand back in that case. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Dan Rourke, you got a question. Hi, Heather. Um, Hi, Dan. You know, so I hear, um, I hear about big audacious goals and, you know, and and I also know as an entrepreneur, you got to keep it simple and make some revenue. And so I guess one of my questions is, is you know, where does the revenue fall into your, um, your view of how you invest? Yeah, you know, I would say we're not super revenue focused. And I think that's one of the things that's maybe held the ecosystem in our region back uh, has been too much of a focus on revenue. We are very customer focused. So we want to understand that customers want this thing. And sometimes the only way you can tell that is with revenue. But in some cases, right. the tech and the team and the concept are big enough that you're like, yeah, people are going to want this. They just don't, they don't believe it's possible. Right, you know, like our pizza making robots, for example, there was no way there was going to be revenue in that deal before we invested. There, there still isn't really revenue in that deal, but they're doing extremely well because people really want it and it's a really great product uh, and the team is amazing. So we're not very hung up on revenue and I think the angel community has kind of given a lot of entrepreneurs um, the wrong message. I mean, it's, I guess it's fine. It's their message, but there's been a lot of concentration in the angel community on revenue. Um, and that I think has shrunk some of the ideas that would have otherwise be big enough to be venture backed, uh, because there's yeah. been this need to get this revenue traction when, you know, you got to kind of make your ideas small in order to do that sometimes. Right. I, I mean, I see, uh, certainly, the metrics for getting to a series a are challenging um and i see also in the northwest it's even more challenging so when you were out um last fall one of the things you said was well maybe spokane should see itself as a suburb of seattle um which i find I, I thought was kind of funny but also true um just as we talk to folks out there so yeah um appreciate your perspective Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, and by the way, I think that just got a lot more true uh, and probably even broader with COVID. You know, you can be a suburb of San Francisco now if you want to be, right? You know, you can choose your, choose your partners. Uh, it really has to do with connectivity. Yeah. 
we're, we're looking right now to, to really up our deal flow of black entrepreneurs as is, you know, every VC I think that is smart. And um, one of the things that we think about for that is, well, why don't we go find a city that has a lot of entrepreneurs who are black and doesn't have a lot of venture capital and look there, you know, because COVID is one of those things that breaks down some of those barriers. And Spokane, you know, you've got so much going for you that you could put yourself out there as a great investment opportunity for a lot of different folks, not just Seattleites. Yeah. So your comment about telemedicine and, and you know, with COVID and how that's all uh, moved forward, you know, how do you guys, how are you building a team? Because you said that you're not really in the healthcare space today. You said yeah. you're trying to build a team to get the knowledge to move into that space. You know, is that a year out or kind of what, what does that look like for you guys? Yeah, we, what we have is um, we're very fortunate that we have a tremendous amount of strength in our limited partner base. So we have the venture partners that we have um, on the team now, and we'll probably be adding one or two more, but the uh, LP base that we have very deep in a lot of different industries and sectors that are important to us and healthcare is one of them. And so what we are planning on doing is kind of creating a little brain trust of existing LPs um, that are very smart in this area and using um, and using them to help us vet these deals. And we'll go slow, you know, if we do one or two healthcare deals um, in the next two years, that'll be probably a lot for us. But I think, you know, looking for that sort of low hanging fruit, something we can get our arms around quickly and understand and that we can use this team to help vet and guide uh, will be the way that we'll do it. Cool. Okay. And, and Dan, Dan is, is, is Heather aware of your company? Uh, we've had a small dialogue on that. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. I, I yeah. just want to make sure you were in discussion because Dan runs a healthcare company. He's been a very successful serial entrepreneur um, in life sciences. Yeah. And his current company, Gestalt, which I'm an investor in, uh, is incorporating AI into its digital pathology platform. So yes. I'm glad the two of you are in, 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 in discussion. Yeah, yeah. Then we will have to we'll have to touch base again for sure. Fantastic. Sounds Katrina, good. you had a question. Absolutely. Um, I've got a couple, if, uh, if uh, Heather will be so kind. Um, you mentioned, of course, that friends and family to Series A gap. How much of that do you think is sort of organic, in other words, due to uh, uh, cost issues? And how much of it is real perceptual? Hmm. I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure that I understand the question. Is it, is it um, you mean, uh, does there, why is Series A getting so uh, hard to reach or? Well, I, it seems like uh, that's, that really is the heart of it, right? It was why is it that, why is it that we're, we have this gulf, right? Yeah. Is that there's a, a natural gulf uh, that's related to the economics of the situation and, or is it also, uh, you know, a, conceptual base, right? So we don't have enough people looking at that space you know, and understanding that space, that expertise to right. be able to provide that funding. Yeah, I think it, it mostly has to do, it's, it's a little bit venture math. Uh, we always say it's more, it's more reverse engineering from the investor side. So the trend in venture has been that the funds that were started 20 or so years ago, uh, which make up the bulk of the Valley funds, they, um, they, and Madrona probably falls into this category as well um, here locally, they, they have raised more and more and more money. And so they need to deploy that in bigger and bigger chunks and need to get, you know, still enough uh, ownership in the company to make it make sense. So it's a process by which they've moved kind of up the stream. And so what used to be called series A um, now would be a seed and what used to be series B is now an A. Um, and of course, you know, there are people going all the way out into these rounds that really look like what public company rounds used to look like, but are now all private, right? You know, you, it used to be you didn't raise $80 million or $300 million in a private market. And now that's happening sort of routinely. So um, it is a little bit just the way that the money side of the supply chain 
evolved and and also um you know it's cheaper to start a company now but it's it the need to scale when scale becomes possible is pretty acute and so the the need to raise still pretty substantial sums to get to you know that sort of billion dollar exit that we all look for as kind of a min bar for a company that we want to invest in is is you know is something that requires still significant capital notwithstanding how you know cheap it is to start a company and how um, capital efficient software still is Okay, great. Um, and then both Dan and Tom uh, referred to your uh, visit last October. It's been uh, pretty close to a year since Triangle. Um, so what have you seen change about the Spokane region and what of that do you like? You know, I wish I had more information um, on what's happening in Spokane. I feel like I haven't been there in since then, uh, which is tragic. Uh, I guess most of us have, haven't been anywhere. Uh, for, for most of that time. Uh, my last trip to the East was um, first part of March going to Tri-Cities uh, and I haven't, I haven't been on a plane since, um, well, other than a float plane. But um, my sense is that Spokane is, you know, continuing to do things right. Um, I, I think uh, the, um, the, you know, the, the continued emphasis on the universities is good and, you know, not just WSU, but all of the universities and continuing to build up that infrastructure and to build around that uh, and to, you know, maintain sort of your livability at the same time is, is definitely the key. Uh, more research, you know, and research funding would be smart. We all want to get to the commercialization of things, but doubling down on research dollars and providing, you know, money for that, I think would make a ton of sense and would be a strength for, for the entire region, but certainly for Spokane. Um, and then one idea I had for you guys, and it's sort of moot right now, but um, I think something you could return to is that Spokane is such a wonderful place to visit and it has great facilities for doing events that when we're allowed to have events again, I would love to see Spokane find a white space and basically stake itself out as the place to go for whatever. You know, remote medicine was my idea at the time, but whatever it is, you know, create the, the world's best and first annual conference that addresses something that happens in the region, um, but that can but that can be, you can pull people nationally and internationally to, to come to every year. And I know you've done that around sports to some degree, but I think doing that around some deep wonky um, area of technology slash healthcare, I don't know what it, you know, it's probably not consumer products, but some, something where you're like, yeah, we do good stuff in this area, create a conference around that. Um, and and pull in people from all over as a result of that, and, and put your you know sort of put your flag in the in the turf um, on that on that area, and you'll find that'll that'll attract companies to you. Um, it will attract companies that want to get into that area to you, um, and uh, and it'll I think it'll pay off from a marketing standpoint pretty substantially. That is a wonderful idea. Um, really appreciate you kind of. Uh, uh, offering that and telegraphing it broadly here, because I, I think there's tremendous opportunity in, in trying to find a white space. And I hadn't thought of remote medicine, but I think now with two medical schools, and I love to brag that there's more medical students in Spokane than there is in Seattle, that yeah. would be a, a, a perfect white space for us to pursue. So yeah, thank you. yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, happy to riff on that some more too. I think there's there's a lot of uh, fertile ground there, but you pick, you know, ag tech is huge right now. You've got, you know, WSU obviously is doing a bunch in that area. AI and ag, you know, there's so many different things that I don't think that space has yet been um, occupied. Uh, and so just, you know, brainstorm a huge list and then decide where you want to, where you want to orient yourselves. Yep. We, we may, we may come back to you for, uh, uh, more color insight on that idea, but okay. thanks again. Amanda Hepper, uh, Med Curry, you had a question. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you so much, Heather. It's an honor to get to meet you. I've seen you speak a few times in Spokane over the last couple of years and have really appreciated your sage advice. Oh, well, thank you. So I I have a question. Um, I like to read, you know, stay current on, on 
business strategy, leadership, all of that. Do you have some books that you would recommend in that arena? Yeah, I'm one of those weird people that doesn't read a lot of books. I know that we're supposed to all be reading books. I actually don't, partly just because of bandwidth. So I read a lot of newsletters. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of good ones on AI. Um, Exponential View is a great one. Um, there's also uh, Inside AI is great. Um, I think the Axios publications, there's a lot of branches to those and you can go into a pretty esoteric area in Axios, so it, you know, and I think that's good. Um, so I, I tend to read pretty broadly um, newsletters and go kind of deep into little, you know, rat holes that, uh, rabbit holes that they sort of point out to me. Um, but rarely do I read a whole book. Uh, I, I kind of, there, there are a few books that are truly great, but a lot of them are sort of, you know, the first chapter sort of tells you everything you need to know. Um, and so I'd rather listen to that person on a podcast or, or read an article that kind of abstracts what they're talking about. Yeah. Totally makes sense. I just have one other question. Um, any tips on networking that you'd like to share? Yes. Um, yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in networking and um, think it's, you know, very gratifying for humans as well as a, a great way to um, be, you know, in the business world. Uh, right now it's harder, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that I do and uh, maybe there's somebody doing it right now uh, um, but, uh, I will, if I attend an event like this, um, I'm of course listening to the speaker as everyone should be, but, uh, I'm also doing a lot of private chats on the side, uh, because this is an opportunity where I can touch base with a ton of people all at once. And they're probably people that are relevant to me because they're here in this space. Uh, so I will have a lot of side sidebar chats. It's kind of the equivalent of a cocktail party. Um, and, you know, and you can see all the participants. So it's, you know, it's super efficient because you can, even if someone you don't know, um, like I'll set up, there's somebody on here that I didn't know and I were attending, I would uh, say, hey, you know, I've been meaning to get to know you. Let's set up a time and I'll shoot in my email. Um, so it is a, um, an actual gift, I think, uh, for uh, sort of efficient networking in, in the COVID era. era. Mm -hmm. uh, but more broadly, I think it's really important to be doing things and to be having ideas that are not related to your personal interests. So I'm really big on saying yes to being involved in things and to contributing my you know, intellect such as it is to other people's projects. Um, and then I have interesting things to talk about with people that are not related to, you know, Heather Redman and her business. Uh, it's, it's just super important to be, you know, trying to find ways to provide value to others. Um, and uh, not in a like goody two shoes way, but just as a way to expand your, your brain and to get new information and, and provide hopefully some insights back um, to the other folks that you're working with. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Good. And, and, and Heather is uh, co-founder of a company in Spokane called MedCurity, and they've got uh, a broad platform of HIPAA compliance uh, solutions, and my angel funds are an investor in her company. But, um, and, and, and we're, you know, we, we've got a number of companies in our portfolio that are, are women-owned or women-co-founded companies. So a question for you is, what's it like to be a female in the VC industry? And um, are you actively seeking uh, to broaden your portfolio with more women-run companies or co-founded companies? And, and can you maybe talk about one or two that you've invested in? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that being a woman in VC is not as rare as it used to be, but being a woman that owns their own firm is still very, very rare. Uh, mostly what we're seeing with women in VC is they're sort of being added to existing partnerships and, and uh, there's a lot of power structures in existing VC that, that you know, don't favor people who don't fit the mold kind of reaching the, you know, the pinnacle of power in a firm. So it's harder for, for firms that are sort of 
out there now where women are already at the center. Uh, it's hard to get them integrated and give them the power that they need to, you know, to really call the shots in terms of making investments, because that's what it comes down to. It's like, how do you get a deal approved? Um, so I feel very fortunate to be one of the few women that, that you know, own, I own a third of our firm, and uh, that's, that's significant and very unusual. Um, part of the reason I did this was because I really wanted women to show up in the sort of most male dominated areas of, of finance and tech and sort of the, the perfect um, intersection of that is VC um, and uh, VC, particularly in a highly technical area like AI and ML. So it's, uh, it was really me trying to provide that role model and to show that it can be done uh, was one of my real motivators in, in starting the firm. The other one, of course, being you know, seeing our region succeed at the level that I think it should succeed. That was my other primary motivator. Uh, we believe that by having a diverse team, um, we will make more diverse investments. And we don't view that as like a burden. We view that as an opportunity because we have a broader network. We're going to see deals that other people won't see, and we're going to win deals that other people won't win. And so we believe we have an competitive advantage by being diverse. Um, we are invested in a lot of companies that have women founders. We have two companies that have women CEOs in addition to women founders. Often women will take the back office role. Uh, so we see a lot of women COOs. Um, and I always say, you know, don't do that. I encourage them to get up there and be the CEO, um, if at all possible. But it's still, you know, it's still a, a, it's still a lot harder to raise money for a company that has a woman CEO than a than a man CEO. And so we have, you know, we have work to do. Clearly. Yep. Um, I want to be cautious of time, but we do have one more question before we sign off. Uh, Kurt, go ahead. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep. So Heather, uh, you're plugged into a lot of deal flow around AI and ML, and I was wondering if you wanted to, I guess, make some predictions on what we can see coming down the pipe here as a closing question. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I'd say that the, the, the technologies that we see all day, every day are natural language processing and computer vision. So good, smart, you know, businesses that are enabled by those two technologies are highly fundable and we're gonna see a lot of those. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is that the cost of processing AI in the cloud is too high. So people that figure out how to do their processing at the edge um, are going to be in better shape in, in terms of um, making their business work financially. So it's not only you know, deploying these sort of well-developed technologies like computer vision and NLP, but it's also figuring out how to deploy them in a way that is gonna make your, your solution more cost-effective than a solution that either utilizes the cloud and in a sort of an undisciplined way or that's rules-based. So really looking at kind of what efficiency you're driving and what is your, you know, your, your cost associated with that efficiency and not just assuming that because you're using AI, it's gonna be cheaper. Thank you. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, it's 101 and uh, part of our promise to you is that we finish up promptly. So just once again, we wanna really thank you for taking time out of what I know is a very busy and active schedule to uh, address the Spokane community here. And um, you know, we very much would love to find a way sometime in the near future to uh, entice you to invest in one of our companies. So uh, we'll yeah. continue the discussion. And in addition, uh, again, love the idea about some sort of a white space conference or, or focus on remote medicine. So we'll, we'll be noodling on that as well. Um, so with that, thank you very much, Heather. And uh, it's just always a, a great pleasure to have you uh, uh, present to us. Well, well, thank you. And uh, we're doing tons of deals in Portland. So we can't, Spokane cannot be far behind. Uh, you guys have got plenty of good stuff going on. So I'm, I am anxious to, to have you keep sending me your deals. Um, you know, we only do a, a few out of the many that we see, but absolutely want to see them. So don't be shy. And uh, appreciate you guys making time for me. It's really, it's a pleasure and an honor to, to be here. And uh, you know, go Cougs and go Spokane. <laughs> Excellent. That's a great closing. Thank you, Heather, Take care. and thank everybody else. Okay, bye-bye. Open out. Thanks, Heather. Thanks.